Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> well, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to talk here today. It's a great pleasure. This is a starting very wonderfully today the meeting and I'm looking forward to the rest of the week's discussions. So a um, couple of changes. First of all, my affiliation, affiliation just changed recently. So I'm at the moment at Swinburne University in the same, same city, Melbourne, in Australia. Um, and uh, the title is a little bit shorter than in the, in, the, in the schedule. So I will be talking about the vortex inertia or the, what, the question, what is the inertial mass of a quantized vortex? So um, yeah, a little bit of uh, my research interests. Uh, so there's four different areas. Today I'll be talking about the first one. You can read the details on the, on the paper cited there. Uh, there's other um, research directions that I'm undertaking at the moment. And as you can see, that was the state of my new laboratory that I'm constructing at the moment. The day I left, all I need to do is to lift in the optical table with all the experimental gear on it and I'm good to go. All right. Thank you, Australian taxpayers myself included, okay, paying my salary. <laughs> so the title of the talk uh, was in the previous slide and the outline of the talk is on this slide. You can read it yourself. I don't need to go into, into the details of that. So very briefly, a um, little bit of motivation. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Um, if you can make vortices very heavy, it would be useful uh, potentially for making higher temperature superconductors um, or at least superconductors that could withstand higher currents. There might be some applications in, in the neutron stars, at least in the research of neutron stars and, and what is going on in there. If you can make vortices light, that would be beneficial if you want to build a topological quantum computer, which is ba basically based on moving quantized vortices of specific kind around each other to break their world lines. So you want to do computations fast, you want to move the vortices fast. And finally, uh, the most importantly for today, uh, what is the role of, of vortex inertia in, in quantum turbulence? That is what we want to study for the sake of studying the problem as we uh, learned earlier today. So before going into the details, uh, the question is, what is a quantized vortex? This is just a reminder that we all know. So a quantized vortex is, a, is an object existing in the, in the wave function or, or in the superfluid. Uh, and at the location of the, of the vortex core, the density of the fluid vanishes and the phase has got a singularity. And the velocity field around the vortex uh, decays as one over the R from the, from the distance of the vortex core, which gives you the uh, one on R squared uh, as the kinetic energy density. Uh, vortices are, in superfluids, they're quantized. So the circulation uh, is quantized and the quantum of circulation is H Planck's constant divided by mass of the, of the molecule that composes those superfluids. So this is, um, most of my talk uh, involves only compressible superfluids, Bose-Einstein condensates. That's the focus today, uh, but we will talk a little bit about other superfluids as well. So knowing what the vortex is, then the question is, what is the inertial mass? What do we mean by an inertial mass? And here, I'm very grateful to the building that helped me out here. Uh, this is what we mean, F equals ma, so m is just the parameter that relates the forces and the accelerations and it's written on the brick wall so it must be right. Um, Everything is right also on the brick wall. Yeah. Ah. There are corrections. Uh, some, <laughs> yeah, somebody can go and hammer in some. Extra points. Okay, so, so this topic has been uh, discussed extensively in the, in the literature. Uh, it's not necessarily so well known but it's there is uh, large body of literature on, on this topic. Um, various different approaches, looking at the 
vortices as relativistic particles, considering what happens in the rotating vortex lattices. What if you pin the vortex and make it move around? What about those forces? Turns out vortices have got a dipole moment. And uh, recently there's been experimental observations on, on this topic as well. So all of these studies have, have I'm, I'm just going to be a little bit simplistic here and, and summarize the main findings. So one finding is that the, the inertial mass of a vortex should be, well, in the limit of the vortex core size RC going to, going to zero, the energy would go to infinity and therefore the mass would go to infinity. So there's this logarithmic divergence there. Another approach is that, well, if you're looking at these vortex lattice structures and, and considering that there, if you take the uh, vortex core size to go to zero, then you'll get that uh, in that limit, the vortex uh, inertial mass would be zero. And then if you're considering this pinning potential scenario where you pin the vortex and then you make it move around, the conclusion tends to be that, well, uh, the whole concept is not well defined. You get an answer depending on what do you, what do you want to measure. And finally, uh, it is also turns out that the, the mass should be negative. Now, this state of the matter is rather, rather a challenge uh, to try to come up with a theory that would accommodate all of these results. Uh, nevertheless, let's, let's see if we can do any progress on this. And, it's often useful to go back in time and read some older works. So that's, that's what, we, you know, what we do here. So, so let's go and have a look at the, the old paper that I stumbled across, where it is stated that Onsager has made a re remark. Onsager apparently was very famous of making remarks. One of his remarks was that uh, a vortex line should have an uncertainty in its position, and it might be so that that uncertainty would even make that logarithm, uh, the diverging logarithm go away. This was, uh, this is a direct quote from the, the paper by Dickling cited over there. Uh, and there Dickling is having a footnote one. And in the footnote one, there is a paper by Professor Weinen, who happens to be within my arm's reach here. So I would like to get a brief, brief comment. Do you happen to remember any any comments from Onsaga on this? No, but it must be true because it's 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 uh, written in the in the paper. So apparently Onsaga has thought about this. So let me uh, let me play around with the idea what it could have been that Onsaga said. So perhaps this is what he said. I found it on the wall again. I'm very lucky that I came early yesterday uh, to discover all these wonderful equations. So there it is. And so I'm taking the, uh, well, since I don't know what Onsager was thinking, um, this is what I was thinking, that if we consider that the uncertainty in the vortex position to be of the order of its core size and the uncertainty in its momentum being its mass times the uncertainty in its velocity, and I can take the uncertainty in the velocity to be equal to the, again, to the position of the vortex core, then I can simply obtain the vortex mass as, as being uh, somehow proportional to the inverse of some frequency that I denote here, omega v. So I'm cancelling h bar and r squared. So r squared is the area occupied by the vortex core, and I'm, I'm taking that to be the, the minimum size of the phase space. All right. So then the question, what could this omega be? It would be nice if this omega would be something intrinsic to the, the vortex. So if, if this is to give us the inertial mass of the vortex, it would be nice that it would be some intrinsic property of the vortex. Um, and what are the intrinsic properties of the vortex? Well, there's eigenmodes. So there's quantized excitations, uh, and these are the elementary excitations in a, in a weakly interacting superfluid. Uh, you solve the Bogolub of the Gene equations, you get the quanta, uh, uh, Bogolub of modes, these elementary excitation modes, either for bosons or fermions. The equations are very, very similar. There's the minus sign that, that is a minor detail today. Uh, and here's one calculation for this bosonic phase. The excitation spectrum is shown 
energy as a function of, of the angular momentum quantum number. And let's have a look at it a little bit closer. So if you zoom in, you can see that there are these low lying modes. Uh, those of you who come from the Code Adams community recognize these modes very well. The one at zero energy is just the condensate itself, the Goldstone boson. Uh, the ones at one are the cone modes, the dipole mode, uh, the sloshing of the, the condensate. And then the one in the middle at zero angular momentum at two h bar omega is the breathing mode. Uh, and then there is this one interesting mode at negative energy. When I say negative energy, it's negative with respect to the condensate energy. So the condensate has got energy mu, that the chemical potential of the condensate, and the, the energy of this uh, specific mode here is negative with respect to that. And this mode is topological. It only appears when you have the, the vortex in the system. So without the vortex, this mode does not exist. The moment you put in this vortex in the system, this uh, elementary excitation mode appears. Um, it was, it used to be called the anomalous mode, the anomalous vortex mode, because it was at negative energy and that seemed anomalous. Uh, it turns out that this anomalous mode has got very uh, clear physical interpretation. It corresponds to the uh, cyclotron motion of the, of the vortex core. So this little uh, movie looking creature here is actually based on a stationary calculation. So we've got a vortex at the, at the condensate, at the origin, at the center, and then you solve the boogaloo of the Gen equations and you add to the ground state, stationary ground state solution, a little bit of the, the, the anomalous mode uh, population. So you populate that anomalous mode and what happens is that the vortex starts moving around uh, its own center, so that at the origin, it goes round and round and round. And this is the, the physical manifestation of this, this anomalous mode. Um, to understand a little bit better what this anomalous mode is, let's do a brief excursion to 3D, the three-dimensional systems, and then I return to 2D systems. So in classical uh, fluids, you've got vortices as well, and Lord Kelvin found the dispersion relation for the normal modes of these, these quantized, well, these are classical vortices. So you've got a straight vortex line, you poke it, uh, that vortex line changes its shape into this helix, and these, these helical vortex modes uh, are called the Kelvin waves. In superfluids, like Bose Einstein condensates or helium 2, there are also um, Kelvin waves, and in that case, they are called Kelvins because they are quantized. These normal modes are quantized. Here's an excitation, again, bubble loop of calculation, excitation spectrum energy or frequency on the vertical axis and momentum along the vortex line of this three-dimensional line on the x-axis. And what I'm plotting here is a linear dispersion relation with angular momentum zero. These are the sound waves. This is the first sound. These are the phonons, Bogolubov phonons in this, in this superfluid. Uh, and this is the low-lying excitation spectrum without the vortex. When you put in a vortex in the system, this is how the spectrum changes. So you get this whole heap of uh, low-lying modes. You can see that there are many, many, many modes at negative energy. These would be the anomalous modes. Uh, but really, what these are, these are just the Kelvin waves on this quantized vortex line. Uh, <clears throat> so we've got a very clear understanding now what, this, what these Kelvin waves are. So the anomalous mode is nothing but the lowest-lying Kelvin wave. Zero nodes. If you think about this three-dimensional vortex line uh, and put zero nodes on it, it's just a straight vortex line that just precesses around and around. That's precisely the physics of this anomalous mode. So let's call it from now on a Kelvin wave or yeah, Kelvin. You said that you just need to put vortex Yes. Where do the Kelvin waves come from? Where do they come from? Uh, I'm looking at the linearized perturbations. So you've got a vortex line in the system, straight vortex line. You're looking at the linearized perturbations to the vortex line. So you tap it a little bit. What does it do? It responds. Right, that's what you're saying. You tap it. Yeah. 
It can be anything. So, so in, in a real system, it can be anything. But of course, numerically, you just calculate the linearized equations. So take the gross pitevsky equation. The Bogolubov equations can be viewed as the linearized gross pitevsky equation, and those solutions give you these normal modes. But you're only looking at one branch of the Kalinov spectrum, correct? It, this is, this is, I'm looking at the whole excitation spectrum of the system at low energies and long wavelengths. So this is, th there could be something at very, very high energies, but I'm not concerned about that because all the, all the interesting physics occurs at the low, low energies here. In fact, so, so these, these modes are lower in energy than the phonons. <coughs> okay, and these were, these were observed in, in uh, Bose-Einstein condensates in Paris, uh, these wiggling uh, Kelvin wave modes in these elongated vortex lines as well, in addition to those, those two-dimensional uh, systems. Uh, here's an example of a two-dimensional system. So there's the simulation, again, that shows the, the motion of the vortex. And these are the experimental observations from Jilla in 2000, where they observed the, the vortex line in, in a sort of uh, spherical, pancakey looking condensate precessing. And uh, the frequency of that precession matches extremely well with that uh, Kelvin, Kelvin mode that you get out of these Google calculations. <coughs> So there it is, it processes in the superfluid round and round and round without any uh, external action on it. So we are not moving it around, it just sits, place it in, create the vortex and it starts going on round, round, round by itself. 10 years later. The amount of minus sign of omega related to the direction of propagation is directional. The, yes, correct. So that's right. So if you want to, stabilize the vortex, you can actually apply external rotation drive that lifts the ang uh, angular momentum into rotating frame, and so, so there are tricks you can play around with it. But in this situation, the, the, the lowest modes are at negative frequency. So anyway, 10 years later, the same vortex in a different laboratory is still going around in the same way. So, so this is a robust phenomenon. It comes with color and in fermions, this is a side view where you can see the, the vortex oscillating. Uh, it actually goes round and round in this elliptical system. And, and here's another example of this, this dynamics. So we understand what the vortex does. So we could not now understanding what that frequency that omega could be. Uh, and it's experimentally observed. So we are well positioned to try to, to look at this uh, question about what is the mass the initial mass of a vortex. So in this situation, the vortex just goes round and round and round in a circle. Uh, so we can relate the, the forces and the accelerations. Uh, it is easy to see what the velocity of the vortex is by looking uh, in the experimental setups. You can also see where the vortex is. So you get both the velocity and the radius. And the only question here then is, what is the force that causes the vortex to go round and round and round? In order to find, find the vortex force, we need to start thinking about how to describe the motion of the vortex. So we've got good equations that describe precisely the motion of the atoms where the vortex is embedded in. So they are the gross pitevsky equation, self-consistently coupled to the bogolov of degen equations. Uh, and I must emphasize that, that you would solve these self-consistently so that the Quasi-particle excitations, for instance, the Kelvin, are in full self-consistent agreement with the, what is happening with the, the condensate itself. So in principle, you can do this. You've got these red uh, pieces here, which are the self-consistent potentials. So rho in particular is the normal fluid, non-condensate density. You need to solve it by summing over all the excitations. In practice, it's easy. You need to only like maybe calculate million eigenmodes or thereabouts. No, it's not easy. But in principle, you would sum over all the excitation, all the Bogolov of excitation modes, find the what is the, the thermal density, and then plug it back into equations and, and on you go. 
So this is, these are the equations that describe the atoms. The vortex is a topological creature within the fluid of atoms, uh, and we need to find out how does the vortex move in this fluid. So I'm taking it as a definition of the location of the vortex. So at t equals something t, at position r, there is a vortex, the orange blob there. And I'm defining the location of the vortex by where does the imaginary part and the real part simultaneously vanish from the wave function. So the psi v is the vortex wave function. And where, where the wave function vanishes, both real part and imaginary part, that's where the phase singularity is. Uh, Infinitesimal time later, the vortex has moved an infinitesimal distance. Uh, and therefore, by definition, the velocity of the vortex is just the derivative of the position with respect to time. So it is useful then to write a completely general uh, wave function. This is entirely general wave function, can accommodate any possible scenario with the vortex in the system. So the first part is just the monopole. It corresponds to the two pi phase finding. There's a phase singularity at location x, v, y, v, and that's where the vortex is located. The second part, the embedding density, accounts for anything else to do with the density. So the, see the first part is linear. So if you take the density, that goes quadratically. So that's the vortex core density there. The square root part takes account for all the sound waves, anything else that is going on in the, in this, in the system. Uh, it is smooth uh, function. And then the last part is the embedding phase that is also a smooth function that accounts for any kind of background velocity field in, the, in this fluid. So this is fully generic wave function that looks after the vortex. And then it's just a matter of plugging this into the previous equation on the previous slide. Then you evolve it in infinitesimal time forward, and then you find where did this phase singularity move. When you do this, this is what you get. So you obtain an equation, velocity of the vortex has got two terms. And I must emphasize already at this point that there's no further approximations. So this applies in the presence of normal atoms, thermal cloud, in the presence of dissipation, you can remove atoms from the fluid, this still applies. So there's no approximations, this is all there is to it. It's got two terms. The first term is the gradient of the phase. The second term is a gradient of the density. So the vortex is driven by two contributions, phase gradients, background phase gradients, and background density gradients. Uh, so, so the first part, uh, you can also view it as if vortex is located here where my coffee is, if there's another vortex somewhere in the system, it induces a velocity field at the location of this vortex, or if there's a boundary, there will be an image vortex that induces a velocity field at the location of my vortex. And that's the first term. So the vortex wants to move with the background velocity field. The second term is a density gradient. If there's a density gradient at the location of the, of the vortex, the vortex is being pushed around by the density gradient as if it was a bubble in a fluid. And it's important to note that that density gradient there looks after everything to do with vortex dissipation, the interaction with thermal atoms, all of this is included in that term because that gradient can point in any direction. And that is immensely important for quantum turbulence. So in a quantum turbulence, you will have lots of sound waves in the system the density is oscillating, and those density oscillations push the vortex in wherever direction it is needing to go according to this equation. So as far as the vortex is concerned, it does not care about the thermal atoms at all. The equation of motion for the vortex is given by this, and all the effects of normal atoms will actually come into this equation indirectly. The condensate density changes because the normal fluid interacts with the condensate and therefore the second term changes and therefore the vortex moves. But this is, the, the vortex is, is a singularity in the condensate order parameter and all it knows about is the condensate order parameter. The condensate order parameter then uh, has got density variations, phase variations due to the thermal atoms and so on and that's how, how it moves around. And we can test this 
So Andrew Rojek has done nice numerical calculations. Uh, this is a harmonic trap, vortex in a harmonic trap at different radial locations on x-axis, and the velocity of the vortex is on the vertical axis. The blue curve is the buoyancy force. The vortex bubble is being pushed to the surface of the condensate, and you can measure the value of the Vm, the buoyancy uh, velocity. You can explicitly measure also the, the red term, which is the image vortex contribution. Yes, there is an image vortex even in a harmonic trap case. And when you sub these two terms, you'll get the green curve. The, the dark, the, the gray tri uh, diamonds are measurements from the Gross-Petersky simulation, where is the vortex? So that's the Gross-Petersky equation uh, solution. And you can see that these match incredibly well. An important point to note here is the inset. If you look at the inset, that tells you what is the angular frequency. So the mainframe shows you the velocity of the vortex and the velocity goes to zero when the vortex moves to the center of the, of the trap. However, what happens to that angular frequency? The angular frequency saturates the finite value. The angular frequency does not go to zero. This is the Kelvin mode. It is always there. You can't get it away out of there. It is always there and it's got some frequency uh, and that saturation value there is, is precisely that, that Kelvin frequency in the limit of vortex is stationary at the center of the trap, but it still has got its uncertainty in its position, jiggles around there with this frequency. So that's the, the, that part. And now that we've got an equation of motion for the vortex, we want to convert that into, into force. So we multiply this vortex equation uh, by mass of the atoms, N naught is the background, uh, condensate density, kappa is a circulation, and hence we obtain a force equation for the vortex. So the vortex force Fv has got two contributions, as already noticed. One force comes from the images or the other vortices inducing velocity field at the location of the vortex, and the second term is the, is the buoyancy force. The vortex is a bubble, and it's floating around in this fluctuating density of this fluid. Uh, it's interesting to note that when you look at the Magnus force, so the Magnus force comes from the difference between the vortex velocity and the superfluid velocity. There it is, that's the Magnus force, and the Magnus force is precisely the negative of this buoyancy force. So that's another way of writing the vortex force, two contributions, you can say that it's the, the point vortex uh, force, if you like, the induction uh, force and the Magnus force. And if the vortex is moving with the background fluid velocity, the Magnus force is zero and does not contribute. So now that we've got the vortex force, we can just plug it in, uh, easy calculation, and out comes the mass for the vortex. So the initial mass of the vortex is given by, well, two terms, uh, the density of the superfluid, well, the condensate density in the background uh, divided by the, the Kelvin frequency. And the Kelvin frequency is the intrinsic property of the vortex. So it is just uh, fundamental as the vortex itself. Okay, so let's take the classical limit. Let's take the circulation quantum to a classical circulation. So if you've got a classical water vortex, there's maybe, or air vortex, there's maybe 10 to 23 Avogadro number of uh, circulation quanta. So we take the large quantum num number limit, Kelvins become Kelvin waves, condensate density becomes the fluid density, uh, and then we obtain a mass of a vortex in a, in a classical limit, which is just the circulation times the fluid density divided by the classical Kelvin wave frequency. And L is just the length of the vortex line, so this, you can look at the uh, vortex mass per unit length. Um, so this is probably not so surprising when you look at the correspondence from electrodynamics. So you've got an electron in a magnetic, <coughs> perpendicular magnetic field. It experiences the magnetic Lorentz force. Vortex move, uh, sorry, <laughs> electron moves on a circle at cyclotron frequency. Uh, and so you can solve the electron mass that way if you, if you do a super 
precise measurement. Uh, this is exactly the same equation that we've got for a vortex. A vortex is just a charged particle moving in this uh, uh, superfluid and the superfluid density rho uh, replaces the, the magnetic field strength in this case. So the equations... Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm not understanding very well. Uh, if you want to calculate the inertial mass of something, you need also an acceleration term in the equation of motion. Mm -hmm. Where is it here? Because, for example, for the charged particle, we have that acceleration term. It, the acceleration is exactly the same as we had previously. It's the centrifugal force. The vortex goes in a circle. Mm -hmm. That's the acceleration. So which are the complete equations of motion for, for the vortex? Time? The complete equation of motion for the vortex is here. That's it. This is the complete equation of motion. So there is no second derivative of the velocity? No. Okay. I'm sorry, I have a very lot of questions but a remark. Could you go back to the formula for the mass, the, the last one? I uh, know you had one uh, with the, well, I mean, on this page? Uh, gamma, the classical one. The ga classical one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so the only thing I want to say, so it, it, so there is a gamma here, H or uh, ha. You have, uh, yeah, this one on the right. Yep. Yes, that's the classical so circulation. It's, it's my remark, if, if you take, you're in a 2D situation, yep. but if you take rho to be a 2D density, then this would cancel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. So, so you, you can either, either take the, you know, the 3D, you can take 2D density multiplied by the length, you get the 3D, 3D mass, or you can just write it as a, as a 2D density and absorb the, the length so of that. dimensional analysis, well, that's the only mass you can make with gamma and omega and rho, right? So, I mean, you've shown that it's a one in front, right? Um, not quite. <laughs> Nevertheless, let's have, let, let's have a look at what, what we can do, do with this. Uh, we started the talk with looking at the other, other results, earlier results. How does this compare with that? So one thing that we can look at is um, first case where the issue seemed to be that the mass would go to infinity because the vortex core goes to zero and then all of that. Uh, we can look at the BC system and, and we can consider small system, non-interacting system where the, the G, the interaction constant, goes to zero, in which case the, essentially the whole condensate becomes just a harmonic oscillator uh, uh, ground state. Uh, and therefore the, the logarithmic term is roughly speaking one. And you can see that this just gives you pi h pi squared on G. The other equation, uh, the Kelvin wave in the in the non-interacting limit actually also goes to a harmonic oscillator eigenstate, which is just minus one, minus one h bar omega. And therefore, that also goes to practically the, the same, same value. So, so these seem to, apart from the minus sign there, these seem to be, you know, in the limit of non-interacting system, this, there's some uh, value to this. The other one is, if you look at the, the Bain Chandler result, uh, uh, you can write it in, actually they write it in, you know, in terms of the, the inertial uh, mode frequency omega i. And you can see, you know, the equation is exactly the same that, that, that we've got here in terms of the Kelvin frequency. But when you look at the, what is the value of the, the inertial mode frequency, you can see that, the, well, in this, these units, the inertial mode frequency is one or two omega, whereas the, the lowest mode in the system is the Kachenko mode, the vortex lattice mode. And that goes to zero. So there's orders of magnitude difference uh, in these two frequencies. So uh, if you, instead of using the inertial mode frequency, if you use the, let's say, the Kachenko mode frequency, uh, then you find that th this uh, result is very similar and uh, doesn't actually give you vanishing vortex mass at all. There's another uh, mass candidate. Uh, in BCS superconductors, and here's the formula for that. Uh, in this case, the omega naught is the uh, Caroli-Degene-Matricon 
uh, vortex core mode level spacing. So for Fermi systems, VCS systems, if you could have vortex in the superconductor, it also has got vortex core localized excitations and the omega naught here would be the level spacing of those modes. And it actually turns out that the factor of two difference here is accounted for the, for the fact that the first uh, mode in the, in the Fermi system is actually at half angular momentum. So that also seems to work fine. Uh, and then there's the experiment. So this puts, puts the first real test uh, for us because if it's measured, it's real. And so we would like to understand that. So this was obtained by Martin Zwieland's group a few years ago, where they studied this, this problem. And seemingly it looks like it's quite different from, from the equation that I've got up there in the right-hand corner. Uh, but let me nevertheless plot on and I'll, I'll replace the gamma equals one for the boson case. That's what I'm considering. So gamma is the polytropic index that just gives you the equation of state in, of these fermionic or bosonic superfluids. And then I am replacing the Kelvin frequency by the analytically uh, found solution in the Thomas Fermi limit for harmonically trapped BC. There it is. Uh, so there is a well-defined uh, uh, Kelvin frequency that has been calculated. And when I plug these in, this is what I get. So these two answers are actually identical in the Thomas Fermi limit. Um, just out of the curiosity, if you're considering a uniform BC, uh, not harmonically trapped, but a uniform system, then you uh, can look at the Kelvin frequency in that case, and you find that the, the vortex mass would be basically two times the num, two times the gravitational mass of all the atoms that are composing the, the superfluid. So the origin of the vortex mass then would be identified coming from the, the vortex core localized uh, modes, the Kelvin modes at the vortex core. So the elementary excitation that emerges when you create this topological object called the vortex, uh, as a matter of fact, what you're doing, the, the alternative view is that, well, the vortex, the, the ground state wave function is your vacuum, and what you're doing is you're creating a particle in the vacuum and that particle is called the Bogolub of Kelvin. And that Kelvin has got a frequency omega and there it is, the blue is the boson uh, Kelvin mode. And you can also get a level spacing if you just draw a straight line there at the vortex core. For the boson case, the red modes are the antiparticles that we throw away. Uh, for the Fermi case, both blue and the red uh, quasi-particles account. Uh, and uh, the CDGM level spacing is uh, put in there. And in both cases, you can interpret the same equation uh, in terms of the lowest lying excitation mode at the vortex core. Okay, uh, just uh, briefly uh, reminding ourselves uh, what happens to a pendulum in a vacuum. There's a pendulum in a the vacuum. There's a Foucault pendulum. Uh, in, not in the vacuum, but, but just to feel that way. That's where I took the photo from. Here's another pendulum, and it's got a mass m. It oscillates at frequency omega. If you please don't try this at home. If you've got a beautiful clock like that, don't put it in the water. There should be some water splash in there. But if you embed this pendulum in, in a medium, let's say a water, you will find that the frequency of this oscillation changes. Uh, and another way of saying is that the, the ad, there's an added mass, the inertial mass of this pendulum changes in the medium. So, so this is essentially what we are doing here. And let's see how this happens in a, in a classical water system. So here's an experiment. This is a real experiment that has been conducted. Vortex rings in water. So there's a piston that moves water. It pushes water through the nozzle. Out comes a vortex ring it goes unstable and creates Kelvin waves. So MP is the mass of the fluid moved by the piston at velocity VP. So that's the momentum imparted in the fluid by the piston. And by definition, we are going to say that this will have to be equal to the momentum of the vortex. Uh, the middle equation there, 
has been verified by this experiment precisely. And so therefore we can solve the mass of the vortex there uh, from the top equation. And that's the equation there. It doesn't look very similar yet, but when you look at an, another old paper from the 1800s, uh, you will find that the, in the case of a vortex ring, the Kelvin wave frequencies go like velocity of the vortex ring divided by its radius. So when we plug this in, now this equation looks very similar. So, so it's quite remarkable that the, the same classical equation seems to work for vortex ring in a water. Gives the experimentally measured uh, inertial mass, added mass of this vortex. So you put the CMEC for the gamma because, I mean, the gamma gets... There's a, yeah, yeah. yes. Just because the, the eta there, there's some uh, fiddling, you know, within factor of pi, <laughs> it is uh, the same. So I didn't put it, it's not exact. So there's, there's some question. I think somebody should really go and do a precise uh, experimental measurement of these Kelvin waves in, in water vortices, which is uh, not done yet, but I think that could be done. Okay, so what did Onsager say? Onsager said that the vortex moves according to those equations that look very much like Hamilton's equations of motion, and therefore often it is stated that, well, that vortices, point vortices would be massless. Uh, so you throw away the momentum equations, vortex mass would be zero, so you throw them away and then you get something similar, but this is not the same equation yet because there is a minus sign there. So instead of that, I am going to move that over there and throw away one dimension and keep the vortex mass. And now the equations are identical. So we need to associate either x or y coordinate of the vortex in this 2D fluid as a momentum of a one dimensional vortex particle. So the vortex is a particle in one dimensional world with two-dimensional phase space. That's rather interesting. So, so this is the point I want to make, um, that you should really view the vortices as 1D particles, not 2D particles. The atoms are living in 2D world, the vortices are living in 1D world. So when you're looking at the fluid dynamics in 2D, you're looking at the phase space dynamics of vortices. And just a brief advertisement here uh, that Chris already mentioned. So P minus 70, P is not the temperature, P is time. So 70 years ago, uh, 49, Onsager's paper had some wonderful insights in it, quantization of circulation, negative absolute temperatures, da, da, da. Uh, one year later, negative absolute temperatures were realized by a person and pound. Uh, and as of this year, actually last year really, but hopefully the results will appear published this year. So there's two, two nice experiments, one in Chris Helmerson's group in, in, at Monash University in Australia, and another one, Tyler Neely's group at the University, University of Queensland, also in Australia. So Chris already gave a talk, Tyler will be giving a talk soon. So stay tuned on to this, and I will finish off with a conclusion. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Time for quick question. It seems to me that uh, your analysis suggests that uh, most of the amount of consumption is going to find the end of the amount of waves. So, 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 it seems to me that your analysis suggests that the work of the amount of waves is fine when the amount of Kelvin waves. The, let's be clear about this. The Kelvin wave is a, in, a, in a vortex. It's an eigenstate of the vortex. It doesn't matter whether you populate that mode, whether you actually make the vortex move and wiggle, the excitation mode is still there. Right, so, so, so the point is that the, even if you look at the vortex, which is not moving, what I'm saying is that no, it is always moving. If the vortex was not moving, if there was a one point in space, a singularity, 
that would violate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and therefore the vortex cannot ever be still, it will always be jiggling around at the, you know, at the vortex core size, so there's an uncertainty in its position. Sure. I understand fully the quantum limit, but what is your gamma here? Can you? Oh, so, what so is the unit of gamma? The, it's the circulation. So circulation integral uh, uh, momentum times distance, P dot DL. So it's just the classical circulation, okay. which is the same as the H uh, Planck constant we divided by mass. The unit of Yes, yes, yes. That's correct. Uh, and and why M, 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 no, actually, <laughs> M is 2D mass, yes. But I divide it by L. Dimensionally, if you want to test, rho has to be a, a M L minus 2, because the other one is a L2 T minus 1, and omega is, I guess, T minus 1, so it has to be rho 2 D. But the question is, why do you have a minus and an absolute value now? Yeah. I, I put the minus in there. Uh, because I put an absolute value on the Kelvin wave frequency because the Kelvin wave frequency is negative. So I'm emphasizing that the, the, the vortex is a bubble. So it accelerates in opposite direction to, to the force. All right. Thank you very much. 15 minutes is a coffee break outside. Thank you.